Hey everybody, John Wagnon here with Dev Central, and in this video we're going to talk about the Kubernetes API. So if you've been following the journey again, last time we talked about Kubernetes, just what it is and the components that make up Kubernetes. So now we want to zoom in a little bit on the API. All right, so the core of the Kubernetes control plane is the API server. So I'm just, I'm going to write this up here real quick, API server, and we're going to dig into what this is, right? Um, the API server exposes an HTTP API that lets end users, uh, different parts of your cluster, external components, communicate with one another, right? Um, and I would, I would remind you that the API server lives on the master node. It's the control plane portion of Kubernetes. So the master node has the API server. It's got the uh, etcd, etcd, key value store, uh, the controller manager, the scheduler. Those are some of the critical components. There could be a couple of others, but those are the critical. Um, and with respect to the API server, everything in Kubernetes is an API object. Uh, so when you talk about having an, having an API first mindset, certainly Kubernetes has that. So everything in Kubernetes is an API object. All right, so when you run um, like a, a kube cuddle, a, the, the kube control command, you're talking to the API server um, and you could also access the uh, API server using REST calls as well. Um, but, uh, but anyway, but the Kubernetes API lets you query and manipulate the state of API objects in Kubernetes, which again, everything in Kubernetes is an object. Um, and so I wanted to dig into the API server and look at the components of what it is, and then we'll kind of uh, zoom out just a little bit and show a, an example of how objects are created and how the automation happens here. All right, so the API server is actually composed of several different steps, if you will. So as, uh, as, a, uh, you know, as a request comes into the API server, then I'll just put a little, uh, let's say you've gotten a, a kubectl command that comes in. The first thing that's gonna happen within this API server um, is called an API HTTP handler. So there we go. So this is just like a, um, it's just like a web server. It's ready to receive HTTP requests, right? The, H the HTTP handler uh, in the API server, right? The next thing that happens once, uh, once the handler receives the request, then the, uh, the request flows through authentication. I'll put that next. And authentication um, is where you have normal user accounts, maybe service accounts, uh, and the authentication step says, hey, should this account be allowed access into the Kubernetes cluster, right, that, uh, that you're trying to access. Given that you're authenticated, the next part is authorization. So I'll, I'll put authorization, and the authorization step is, you know, can you as a user, now an authenticated user, can you create, delete, update, list a given resource within the cluster, within this Kubernetes cluster? This is where role-based access control rules are evaluated, right? Um, let's say you get through the authorization step, the next part is called the mutation, uh, mutation admission controller, uh, admission controller, controller, right? All right, the mutation admission controller. This is responsible for looking at the YAML file. I remember the, the input to this, you know, H, or this API call is a YAML file. So it's gonna, it's gonna look at the YAML file and it's gonna mutate this file as needed, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe you've forgotten to include something, maybe some kind of default value or whatever, this mutation admissions controller or admission controller is going to update the file or mutate it or change it so that it is a valid file for this uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? Once it gets through, um, once you pass through the mutation admission controller, then you come into schema validation. So here's schema validation. And the schema validation is the place um, where uh, it, you know, it determines is the resource still valid against the internal schema after these modifications um, you know, have been made. So is the YAML file malformed at this point or not? And that's where the schema validation takes place, right? And then after that, if it passes through that, then it goes through the validation, validation um, admission controller, right? So this is, let me write this out really quick, admission controller, all right? All right, so kind of like the mutation admission controller, this is now the validation admission controller. This is the gatekeeper, if you will. This, this uh, you know, let's say you are trying to deploy a pod in a namespace that doesn't even exist, or 
maybe you deploy, you know, you're trying to deploy more resources than you are allowed to deploy or that you have access to or that kind of thing, then that's where this gatekeeper would come in. Um, I want to put a little, uh, you know, star by this, by these two right here. And you may ask along the way, hey, could I, could I create my own rules? Like, can I modify these to, to fit my own needs? And the answer is yes, you can. So you don't have to take, you know, the out of the box default values here. If you have some special, you know, um, mutation or validation controls that you want to put in place, then you can totally do that. All right, so let's say that all of this stuff checks and then you come out the back side, then what's going to happen once it gets to the API server, then the resource is going to be stored and ultimately destined for the ETCD key value store, right? So this guy right here is really important. Okay, so we'll, let's, uh, let's kind of go back from the API server and look at maybe a diagram of creating, uh, let's say we want to create a pod in Kubernetes uh, via this API call, right? So what happens? All right, so I want to create a pod. So I would create a, uh, a YAML file. So um, let, me, let me say, you know, this is the control plane, which would be the, you know, the master, master node, right? which includes all of those things that we, uh, you know, that we talked about before. So it's obviously going to have, you know, the API server, right? It's going to have the um, ETCD, uh, you know, key value store. It's going to have the scheduler and it's going to have the uh, controller, controller manager, right? So I'll just put manager like that, right? Okay, so it's got all these different components in the master node. This is the control plane of the Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> so if I'm out here, I'm a, you know, I'm a happy uh, person, um, my user, and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to send the YAML file into uh, the API server, right? And so I send via a kube cuddle uh, command, I create this YAML file, I send this into the API server, and the request obviously goes to the API server. All right, as soon as the API server receives this, what does it do? It creates a pod object. So I'll just write it maybe right over here, pod object, because what did we say before? Everything in Kubernetes is an API object. So it creates a pod object and then it updates um, uh, etcd or etcd with the new pod object. So now etcd has got this new pod object uh, loaded in it. All right. One of the things that the scheduler does is it constantly monitors the API server, right? So as, as soon as this pod object is, uh, is you know, created here and then etcd is updated, the scheduler is going to say, hey, I just noticed something changed. And so it's going to see that the new pod object has been created. And so what it's going to do is it's going to begin to look for appropriate resources or an appropriate node. So let me, let me just come over here. I'll say, you know, here's a, here's a worker node that's out here doing its thing. And, uh, and it may have a variety of pods already created. So I'll just, you know, let me put a, a pod here and maybe another pod. And remember what's in these pods, it's the uh, application containers, right? Um, and so, but now we're trying to create a new pod. And so the scheduler is going to say, hey, I got to get to work and find a worker node that can handle this new pod, right? And so it's going to provision, um, or it's going to, it's going to find a node to provision the pod on. So the scheduler finds the appropriate node within the cluster and it says, hey, um, I have found the node and it's going to contact the API server. And then the API server is now going to update etcd again saying, hey, I have found the node. Here's the, here's the node that this pod is going to go on to, right? Um, and so, the, uh, so then at that point, the API server, um, it, it has updated etcd with that information. But then the API server is going to send information to, and this is another part of the worker node, if you remember, uh, I'll write it maybe right over here, this thing called the kubelet, right? And we talked about these, the kubelet and the kube proxy we talked about in the last video. So the API server is going to contact the kubelet that works on this worker node that's attached to this worker node. And, uh, and it's going to say, hey, um, kubelet, you need to get information from the API server uh, and, you know, regarding this pod object. And then you need to contact the, uh, the container runtime. So the kubelet is going to work with the container runtime. I'll just put a couple arrows here. And in this case, let's say it's Docker, right? And we talked about all these things. Docker is the container, you know, place, right? There's, and there's more than one container, you know, organization or technology out there. Docker is the most popular one. Um, so let's say in this case, Docker is the, the runtime that's, you know, that's, that's working these pods and containers, right? 
So then at that point, the container runtime would create the pod and it would update the kubelet saying, hey, the pod has been created. So now we've got, you know, this new pod. I'll just put it over here, you know, so this, this guy's the brand new, shiny new pod, right? Um, and then at that point, the kubelet updates the API server again saying, hey, pod has been created. And then the API server updates etcd again. And then, um, so now etcd has all the information. So you can see, I didn't draw arrows on every bit of that little thing, uh, but you could, hopefully you could kind of follow along how everybody's talking to everybody else and, and just the process of that, of that whole, you know, all that work to be done to create the pod. All right, but at the end of the day, etcd holds all of the information. It says, hey, a new request has come in via this YAML file. There's a pod object that the API server needed to create. Um, there's a, a node that has been established via the scheduler. Uh, Docker has created the new pod. All of that information comes back here. That's why we said in the, in the last video that etcd, I'll put you know, SOT right here. This is the source of truth for the entire cluster, right? So you can always, you know, you can, you can recreate the entire Kubernetes cluster uh, if it were to fail for some reason based on the information held within etcd. That's why I think it's so important. Um, and if, if you remember back here, etcd is what's updated. So all of this stuff in the API server, this, all of this happens every time this guy right here is, is contacted. So there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, but I thought it would be nice just to show not only what happens internal to the API server, but also, you know, just a kind of a process flow of, a, uh, of creating a new pod, for example. Um, so all of this stuff is done automatically. It's all automated. And so this, you know, the API server is that, it's like that central nervous system. It's the, you know, it's, it's the brains behind this whole operation and everything goes through that. And so this is, this is uh, you know, becoming, it's, it's more than just another command line experience to interact with the API server, but this is, this is truly um, an automated experience. And so when you talk about automated pipelines and processes, this allows for all of that to happen. So uh, API server on Kubernetes is absolutely critical. And I uh, hope you've learned a couple of things about it here in this video. So thanks for watching this Lightboard. Hey, if you like this thing, you can click up here on our DevCentral logo and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you guys out there in the community.